Uh, can you hear me, Paul? Yep. Okay, cool. So, yeah, let's start off with the recitation, uh, everybody. So, welcome and uh, thanks for the people who actually came in person uh, and it's too early here. And thanks for the people who joined in Zoom. So, for the first half of the recitation, uh, like most of the part, we'll actually be going over what Prof has taught uh, in today, like this week's lectures. And the next part will be going into PSE, which will actually help you guys in. Uh, uh, computing resources. So uh, the problem which we had until now was sequence to sequence conversion. So which you'll be doing in homework three P two. You have an input sequence which might be uh, a sentence or an audio signal, anything, and the output is also a sequence. Uh, it is not necessary that uh, uh, the input and the output should be uh, time or order synchronous. Time synchronous is when you have for each input you have an output and order synchronous the order in which inputs occur the same order in which uh, the output should occur. So an example of not having order synchrony is the second example in which you translate an English sentence I ate an apple to Ish Hava Aina Apple Gagason. Uh, so apple is at the uh, no no not apple yeah eight is actually in the second word here but. Uh, in German, I think it's at the end. Uh, so you don't actually have a technic uh, technically order synchronous sequence. So these are the problems which you'll be facing in sequence to sequence conversion. And uh, moving on to the language model, which uh, we had seen in, uh, this week, uh, you have uh, word, words in, from the vocabulary. You have like a few thousand or even 10,000 of words. So you usually represent each word as a one-hot vector. So if you are trying to represent the first word, there's just one and zeros everywhere. If you're trying to represent the second word, it's two, now zero, one, and zeros everywhere else. So this is a very sparse representation. To make it a little dense and you want to decrease the amount of features used for representing, you project it to a lower dimensional feature space with the projection matrix or the projection layer as shown here. So this is basically a word embedding. You pass the word embedding to your language model and uh, it actually generates an output for each time step. So uh, these green boxes are the language models and you, you can actually have a lot of layers, uh, multiple layers, LSTM or GRUs or so on. So that's how any language model works. Take a one heart, uh, take a one heart word, W1 projected, get the word embedding, pass it through the sequence model and uh, get the outputs. So which is basically a translated output of, it depends on your application. So moving on, uh, just to note about uh, the language models, uh, you have, you just uh, try to predict sentences or convert sentences from one languages to another, especially in the case of generating a new, uh, like for example, a poem or something, you actually need a, pretty, a particular start to a sentence and an end to a sentence, or else, for example, four score and eight, uh, that can be from any context or so on. So for this reason, you actually need where the sentence is starting and where the sentence is ending. So SOS and EOS markers are important, especially when it comes to generation. So some examples are given here. So four score and eight uh, can actually mean anything. It's but assuming that it doesn't have an SOS and EOS, it's clearly from the middle of a sentence. Uh, if you just have an SOS at the first part and followed by a few words, that means this fragment is actually from the start of a sentence. And the same actually applies to EOS. Having SOS and EOS together means that the sentence has started and you have a bunch of words and the sentence has ended. So uh, we'll be using SOS and EOS as, like, more importantly for generating. Uh, the next one, yeah, going on to the problem, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is no, we don't actually assume any synchronicity uh, between the input and output. And uh, this is actually our problem. And uh, another thing which I thought of doing it in the start of lecture, try to remember this number, like 4358. So just try to remember this number and we'll get back to it later. So going on to the modeling problem, and uh, yeah, this is the typically modeling problem which we have. You, this is basically called a delayed sequence to sequence, which means first you have the inputs which are represented by the pink boxes. You send it through uh, 
through the sequence model, you get the hidden output, hidden representation, and then uh, you decode it to get the uh, final output. So what this basically does is, you pass in the inputs together to the sequence model, but you don't start predicting your output. You just get the summary of an out, uh, summary of the inputs uh, at this last final hidden representation, and this summary basically, with this summary, you try to like build on the summary and uh, uh, get the output. So this is how it, you can actually imagine the case of a language translator. If you are speaking in a in a different language, you have to explain the translator everything, every word, every words in the sentence. You just have to let them know, and they will af after they get the sentence, they, after they understand the sentence, they will translate it to another language. So that's how things actually work. Because as I told earlier. Order synchronicity might not be there, so each languages will have a different structure, uh, different uh, grammar, and so on. So uh, another thing to note about this summary is that you can also treat uh, like from homework to P two uh, the features which you have gotten from ResNet thirty four, ResNet fifty, or Connex. Uh, Connex seven sixty eight features and ResNet is five one two or two zero four eight. You can just imagine that to be the summary of your image. So yeah, that's basically it. You've already done a pretty much summary generation, or it's not a human readable summary, but kind of a compressed representation of your input data. And with that, you can actually try to expand on it, create another uh, sequence, generate something else, and so on. So moving on to the simple translation model, as I told earlier, you have uh, wait just a minute. Yeah, this is a better presentation. So you have the encoder which uh, takes all the input input words, uh, passes it through the uh, input embeddings, to be precise, uh, passes it through a sequence model, and the red state, which is actually given shown here, is the uh, summarization of your whole sentence, the input sentence. And with the summarization of the sentence, which is basically the final hidden state, this, with this, if you pass it through the input, you can actually generate your uh, translated language or anything as per your application. So this can be generalized to like multiple LSTM layers. Uh, it's up to you, your application, which, whichever you need, whichever gives you a better performance, you can actually use that. And uh, yeah, you, are, you also must be knowing that at each time step in the output, you will basically have a probability distribution among all the uh, classes or words in a language model. So uh, you actually try to select the most probable output and to give it to the next time step, what you can also do is you can sample a word from the generated distribution and then pass it to the next output. Uh, next uh, input as shown here, like it's just sample here and it is passed as an input to the next uh, next sequence time step in the uh, decoder. So for a typical generation, generation process, uh, you do it until you get the EOS. So EOS kind of denotes where you have to stop this process. So that's kind of the key here. And yeah, moving on to how you are training the language models. Uh, you basically have an encoder which gets the summary. With the summary, you generate all the uh, all the outputs, and uh, you you generate the predicted outputs. And uh, this is kind of straightforward and forward pass. So the backward pass, you have uh, you have the actual actual words over here, and uh, you calculate the divergence between the actual word and the predicted word, and uh, back propagate it throughout the network. And uh, to just understand it better, uh, can we con if you consider this fourth time step, you calculate uh, calculate the divergence between the uh, ground truth word and the uh, predicted word. And the divergence is actually passed across all the time steps. The reason why we do this is because, as you can see, uh, for this fourth time step in the decoder, it has actually seen the inputs, seen the, all the others as an input. So any small change in either one of these will actually affect the computation of divergence over here. So that's basically how you calculate the gradient flow. And uh, if it doesn't actually affect the gradients, uh, you don't actually have to like uh, uh, update those weights. Gradients are updated only when it actually causes any kind of a change. So that's something which uh, is being done here, which is also shown. And some trick, uh, tips of trade for back propagation and reducing the number of compute is uh, instead of calculating the divergence for every time step in the output, 
you can randomly calculate the divergence for some words and just back propagate that alone so that that can also be done uh, yeah so to reiterate this hidden state representation is basically a summary of your whole input uh, sentence so if you actually get the uh, embeddings of this last final hidden state pass it through a tsne so tsne is basically a visualizer for uh, uh, you can convert your hide embeddings into like small features and uh, visualize them you can actually find clusters of sentences which are similar to each other so one thing which you guys can actually try out is take your uh, convex or respect model from homework uh, homework 2 uh, run it through your data set get the features from uh, all the output images and after getting the features pass it through a tsne you will actually get a, uh, you have to use the n components to be two in tsne then plot those as a form of a cluster you can actually identify distinct clusters and when you try to sample images from those clusters you can actually see that those images are similar so if they are similar your uh, classifier has done a pretty good job in discriminating them so basically that's what is being done here also you get a uh, compressed version of the input and you plot it but there's actually a problem with this uh, network so uh, does anybody remember the number which i told a couple of slides back the number of what i actually i told to try to remember this number right so does anybody remember that number yeah it's impossible because after hearing what the number is you have gone through a couple of slides and you would have actually forgotten it right like that's Sorry, which number is the no i just that, that's just a test i just wanted to see if people are able to remember the number which i told like 10 slides ago clearly like humans we don't have a lot we might be but some some of you might actually remember the number i think it's something with four or something four three something uh, this is the same case with language models when uh, the input the uh, influence of the initial input kind of fades away when you pass over time similarly what happened with us now no one is actually able to remember the number which i stated uh, like 10 slides ago i guess so that's the same thing which actually happens to language models so when you have a long input sequence uh, when you come to the last hidden representation the summary representation you the influence of the initial words kind of fade away so this is something which is problematic in uh, language modeling so instead of uh, so the the reason why this is happening is that uh, this final hidden state is overloaded with a lot of information and uh, it is kind of impossible for it to capture long range sequences so to tackle this issue what we can basically do is we can actually uh, have a an average of all the inputs and pass everything to the output time steps for decoding so you get the input embeddings average it and then pass it here in the uh, decoders so one thing which is not observable here is ish is more related to i than eight or an or anything else because ish means i in probably means i in uh, german so we don't have that kind of information so it will be better if we have an information which relates which output depends on which input right so that's what we aim to do in the next step so instead of just naively taking the average of all the uh, in, all the embeddings uh, embeddings in the input uh, you can actually take a weighted average so uh, i'll try to explain with this figure so this is basically a normal average but what if you have a weight in this connection or uh, in this connection this connection all the five connections so uh, and each goes to a diff, uh, each has a different output for different input to the uh, decoder states so for ish you can uh, actually like visualize that this weight will be higher compared to all the other weights and for uh, apple the weight relating the connection between apple this weight will actually be higher compared to the other ones so that's what basically attention does you have a context vector uh, so the context vector is generated uh, with the weighted sum of the uh, uh, input hidden states and you pass it through uh, to the uh, decoder hidden uh, decoder and uh, if you can uh, like uh, imagine c0 
C0 will be having a lot of weight from I rather than all the other words because C0 is the context of the uh, ish, the uh, hidden state, which is actually the, uh, generating ish. And for Apple, it's the same. Uh, that's how attention actually uses everything. And these weights are dynamically computed. And uh, you also do back propagation to learn these weights and so on. So uh, to, to briefly summarize, uh, so to make the uh, weights so that for C0, higher weight is for the uh, first word, the I, like for app, Apple, higher weight is for uh, Apple in English. You can use a soft max, which kind of sums all the weights to one. And uh, that's basically it for attention. And uh, moving on to the other ones, wish. So yeah, ideally, uh, yeah, based on the summary of attention we just had, we use uh, certain weights that we uh, get via softmax that basically tells uh, the decoder what parts of the input are more relevant or important to attend to, right? And um, that's kind of why we have a softmax there as well uh, that basically helps your decoder, RNN, or whatever network it is to understand which parts of the input to focus on uh, for you know, what a specific hidden state in the output decoder. So in the forward pass, you would be passing the input through the encoder to produce hidden representations, which is something we already know. And then you'd initialize a decoder hidden state. The simplest way is to initialize it to zero. Alternatively, you could even learn the initial hidden state. Uh, you could use the uh, encoder's last hidden state as your initial decoder's first hidden state as well. Uh, you could also have a learnable parameter uh, with the matrix WS uh, that you use to multiply with the last enco uh, encoder hidden state to generate the decoder hidden state, the first hidden state. So you start with the start of simple sequence and then you continue this process, uh, essentially getting context that, that is fed into the computation of the decoder's hidden state uh, with the attention process and continue this until the end of sequence symbol is produced, which is when you would stop this decoder uh, forward pass process. So a modification here is like we saw in lecture where we want to, uh, you know, in the context of retrieval systems, uh, think about attention as having uh, a query key value system where keys and values are associated with the encoder. And then you have the decoder that queries the encoder to uh, based on the keys and values that the encoder produces to understand which parts of the uh, input to the encoder are relevant. So, the encoder will, will be responsible for outputting a explicit key and value at each input time step. And the decoder will output a specific query at each time step. And the query is used to evaluate basically uh, which specific input it has to pay attention to in order to compute the output for that specific time step. And the weight is obviously a function of the key and the query. Uh, the context in this case will be the weighted sum of those values that you'll generate. And uh, a special case, like we saw in lecture, is where you know the keys and the values are equal to the hidden state of that specific time step, and the query is equal to the previous hidden state of the decoder's time step. So uh, you know this is usually done because it simplifies things when we want to think about attention, uh, and this is also commonly used uh, in a lot of uh, literature. One of them, which we will be talking about soon, um, in a sense. The key component of this model is obviously the attention weights that you'll generate. It captures the relative, relative importance of each position in the output and how it corresponds to each position in the output. So multi-head attention, uh, the idea is that, you know, perhaps uh, there are different aspects of the input that are, you know, relevant to your task, right? So maybe uh, in your translation task, you're also, you'd say you're worried about what exactly the previous word was and how that establishes context for the next word, but you're also worried about parts of speech, like, oh, exactly, if this is a verb and then the previous verb, pre previous word was an object, you want, you want to kind of pay attention to that relationship as well in the, in the translation part. So the idea is to have uh, different heads in attention, basically, which is just, you can think of multi-head attention as um, single head attention, but just having different blocks of single head attention where each head is basically just having their own weight matrices for queries, keys, and values. So uh, the idea is that each of these weight matrices 
tries to learn a different aspect of the input that is relevant or the decoder has to pay attention to when it's computing the outputs. So that's kind of the idea behind multi-head attention. So you'll have multiple key query value sets and each attention head uses one of these sets uniquely. And then the combined context of all of these are passed to the decoder, usually they're concatenated. Uh, so each of these attenders focuses on a different aspect of the input. Uh, so teacher forcing in this case, uh, you know, it's like what uh, the professor was saying, it's like having a teacher in the room where a student has to learn, but the student points a gun to the head of the teacher. Uh, but uh, yeah, essentially what you're doing is you're kind of cheating your way through uh, helping the decoder learn by telling it what exactly uh, the ground truth value also is for that specific time step. But you do it at a random with, with a uh, you know a random probability. You don't do it all the time because you don't want to cheat too much, but you want to cheat a little bit so that you know the process is easier for the decoder to learn in some sense. So uh, yeah, you use the embedding of the uh, transcript or the you know it depends on whatever task you use. But if you're using a translation task, you typically use an embedding of the transcript as well and feed it to uh, the attention process. So so that you know, the decoder also understands, oh, this is the ground truth, but this is also the input. So how exactly do these correspond in some way? Uh, this is how a typical attention plot looks like. So the diagonal basically tells you which parts of the input are most relevant to which parts of the output. And as you can see, uh, you know, typically it, it's the attention usually, you know, when it works well, it forms a diagonal, uh, but it, it's not really consistent all the time that it has to form a perfect diagonal, but you know, that's kind of how it works because uh, the relevance of each parts of the output to the input isn't exactly like linear, it doesn't have to be linear all the time. Uh, this is an example of how exactly, uh, you know, uh, part, this is an example of exactly how uh, different parts of the input or, you know, correspond or which of the uh, different parts of the input are relevant to your task. Uh, you have natural language inference, sentiment analysis, positive and negative, right? And, uh, Attention uh, is also used for models and image captioning. So you have uh, attention being used for uh, speech to text transcription. You have image captioning where you have uh, these famous papers, listen, attend, and spell, and then you have show, attend, and tell. So uh, tries to use visual attention to see which parts of the image are most important for your caption. As you can see there, uh, this is in a sense, a uh, the white spots in the image are basically the areas that uh, the model is trying to uh, focus on when it's generating the caption. So Frisbee is highlighted when uh, the model is trying to generate Frisbee as a caption. Dog is highlighted when the, you know, the model is trying to generate dog as a caption. So uh, you use different parts of the input to try and generate a caption for the specific image. So listen, attend, and spell is in short LAS. You, uh, is a similar approach, but uh, in a sense you'd have uh, you know, an audio file and, you know, different parts of the audio file are relevant to different parts of your transcript because you want to understand which parts of the audio file are relevant to which parts of the transcript you're generating. So it's essentially speech recognition. And the way listen, attend, and spell works is that, you know, typically we use convolutional neural networks for downsampling, right? Uh, we try to use, we try to reduce the time resolution in the input using convolutional neural networks, but an, another option or the specific option that listen, attend, and spell deals with is by using a pyramidal LSTM. So what this essentially does is try to mimic what convolutional neural networks do, like typically do. Uh, they, in essence, you know, between different hidden layers, they try to concatenate adjacent time steps and then perform the uh, typical RN operation between layers so that you're in essence reducing the time resolution between the layers. So in, in some ways, what you'd be doing is when you generate the first hidden layers uh, output, you'd be reshaping it so that you concatenate adjacent vectors and then you'd be uh, going to the next layer and then you'd be reshaping the next layers outputs as well. And then you'd be uh, concatenating adjacent vectors there. And then you keep going as long as you have layers left in the LSTM, but that's kind of how you're down sampling with an LSTM, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so the idea is to kind of reduce time resolution you'd be dealing with odd and even outputs. When you're dealing with odd and even outputs for an LAS, you typically want to pad so that you know you, don't, you get rid of those cases, pad your inputs in such ways that you don't reduce or you don't lose information. And other way to do this without reshaping is to also try and use pooling operations. 
because you might want to average inputs instead of concatenating them. But the reason why we typically concatenate is that we don't lose information through the averaging process, if that makes sense. The decoder here in the LIS process uh, is similar to how, you know, Aparajit and previous slides were talking about this. You start with a typical start of sentence sequence. Uh, at each time step, you generate a hidden state and then you uh, use the decoder's hidden state and the encoder's hidden state, which is coming from here at the bottom to compute the context, which is then, uh, you know, used as the context for the next time step. So that makes sense to generate the next hidden state. And typically you also see uh, Y2, Y3 and YS minus one being there. The reason why we have that is in case you're using teacher forcing, you might also want to use an embedding of the, of the, the ground truth transcripts uh, to compute your decoder hidden states as well. The design is usually having dot product attention. What this usually means is what the type of attention we've been talking about all along, uh, where you just want to use a query key and value, and you want to use weight matrices for each of those, and then uh, compute your attention. Uh, you have two RNN layers with this, and then finally you have an MLP and a softmax with a character distribution. So listen attendance spell is used for uh, you know generating characters, but you could also use it for word-based transcript generation as well. But uh, in the paper, I believe they use it for character distribution. So they generate one character at a time for each time step. And they use beam search for decoding. Beam search works a little bit differently for uh, this process. And the reason for that is because you don't have a fixed probability distribution for your entire output, right? Because you're generating one output at a time and it depends on the context that you get from the previous output. So you don't really get a fixed output dis probability distribution overall that you can end up decoding, uh, you know, finally like you do in CTC. In this case, you'd have to worry about how exact, what to choose at each time step, because what to choose at each time step depends on what you chose at the previous time step. And what you chose at the previous time step also, you know, it depends on the attention values you're getting. So it gets a little more complicated because the probability distribution that you're getting is not fixed for your output entirely, right? So the decoding process has to happen while you're actually uh, going through this process in your uh, decoding RNN. So the beam search will be a, the fundamental concept behind beam search still stays the same. You want to evaluate K hypotheses still at each time step. Uh, the only difference being you don't have a fixed probability distribution. So you have to be doing it along with the RNN generation process. That makes sense. Um, I think that's all. I think we can move to the PSC. Um, yeah, sure. So is it like online decoding? Like exactly, online yes. Online it's kind of uh, it's essentially online decoding. You'd be doing it for every time step as you keep getting context from your encoder and you're generating your uh, hidden state for the decoder. Yep. You, you said attention, but is, is there any attention here? I thought this was a pyramidal LSTM. Uh, no, the, the encoder uses a pyramidal LSTMs, but essentially you'd be getting an encoder hidden state at the end of the pyramidal LSTM, which you're still going to use for computing attention like you typically do. You'd just be passing the encoder's hidden state that you get from the end of the pyramidal LSTM as you're, uh, you know, to generate Queries and uh, uh, sorry, keys and values. But, but I thought instead of using the last hidden state for attention, you consider all of them. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're not exactly downsampling everything to just one hidden state. Okay. You're downsampling by a factor of two. So maybe from ten to five, when you're doing attention on the five. Five, exactly. Okay. Right. So that's kind of it. In a sense, you're trying to replace CNNs, the job of CNNs, which is LSTMs, by modifying how typical LSTMs work. Any yeah. other questions on Zoom, perhaps? Yeah, I think we can move on to PSE. Yeah. One thing which I forgot, forgot to mention, I guess, is this is the network which we'll be using for homework four. Right. And it will be uh, kind of hard, so be prepared for that. <laughs> so this is just a no, I don't exactly mean to scare you, but no, it's 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 fundamentally the, the ideas that I'm presenting here, you'd probably be hearing again in homework four. Uh, and I believe the, yeah, uh, We'd go over it in more detail when we come to the home for boot camp and the right time as well. So this is just to give you, a, you know, a, let's just say a taste of what you're going to get in home of four, if you will. Oh, actually, uh, I don't have slide this delete cutter.
Cool. Uh, so to move on with uh, PSC. So PSC is the uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, which was which has actually offered our course a lot of units, a lot of GPU units, and these resources will actually be helpful for you guys for every homework and everything. This is actually a shared resource. So and we almost have like 6,700 700 units. Usually for a course of like 60 people, they'll give uh, 1,000 units, I guess. So assuming that we have around uh, 400, which we actually don't, so we also have a lot of other credits left. So we have a lot of uh, credits from PSE for our course. And the first thing which you need to do to access PSE is uh, go, go to access again, uh, and sign up, uh, create a, create an account with access. This is pretty uh, straightforward. You just need to click on this link and uh, uh, just go to this. Can we get that link? Hmm? Yeah. Okay, okay, I, just a minute. Uh, yeah, they're not on Piazza, but if you just give me a minute, I can actually put it on Piazza now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you don't, you can actually download and put it on Piazza. I'll be present here. That will be better, I guess. Yeah. You're, you're an editor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can reply to the P uh, PSC post or something. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. So, uh, so yeah, first is going to access signing uh, signing up for an access ID. So that's the first step which you'll need to do. Uh, after you click this, which is register with an existing identity, you have to use your uh, uh, Android ID, your CMO details uh, to actually finish signing this up. And uh, after this, after signing up, uh, please fill this form. You will actually get an email ID with your access username. And with that, please complete filling this form. Uh, we'll give you one point bonus for actually completing this. It's like uh, giving bonus uh, to get a resource, like giving candy to get more candy. So, so, so after completing it, uh, please fill this form. So, if we know your user IDs, we can actually give you uh, access to the available credits which we have. So, please don't forget to do that. After signing up with access, uh, we will actually receive another mail from PSC in like an hour or a day. So hopefully after this recitation, uh, you would have actually completed filling up access credentials and uh, by tomorrow or uh, possibly to even uh, today evening, you might actually receive a mail from PSE with your uh, uh, PSE username. With this PSE username, you can actually uh, SSH into the PSE servers and access GPUs which are available. And it is pretty straightforward. So I'll be helping you go over uh, how you can actually access the uh, PSC GPUs. So uh, before going to that, uh, we'll be talking about PC and bridges. Uh, the main thing which you need to focus on is login nodes and compute nodes. So login nodes are the nodes which you actually use for logging into your uh, uh, PSC server. So SSH uh, terminals. So login nodes have a pretty okay compute, but uh, we don't run anything on login nodes. You have specific GPU nodes for it, the compute nodes for it. Uh, so running anything on login node, it's not beneficial for everyone who's actually using the server. So please remember that you have to run all your training, testing and everything in uh, GPU nodes. Uh, so the first thing how you can actually go to a login node is by following this command, SSH username. This username, you'll actually get it from PAC after a while. So some uh, for some people, I've heard that you access user access ID was actually enough for it, but uh, I'm not very sure about it, but uh, it will definitely work with your PAC user ID. So the first command is that. So you just need to SSH into your, with your user ID. And when it will actually ask you your password, so just type in your password. Actually, I think I typed it wrong. Sorry about that. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Just a minute. I made a typo in my user ID, which probably you guys won't make, but that's a pretty uh, dumb mistake to do. The fonts are pretty small when, when I share my screen, so it's getting a little confused. Yeah, so got it. So this is some uh, something which you need to do, like with the login node, you'll actually log into the uh, PAC server. And when you log into this, you'll actually know that this is actually inside login node as shown here. So it's, it's specified login 011. So it means that it is a login node. Uh, it's, good, it's good to have this saved somewhere because I'll be uh, talking about the advantages of saving your login ID here. Yeah, the next line itself says it. So if you want to resume uh, your progress from the same login node, you need to remember it. So I'll say why you need to remember it later. And yeah, so to go to the same login node, you can actually use this command and uh, go to the same login node. But for now, we'll, yeah. These are the commands which I actually just showed it here. So in the slides. And uh, you must be knowing about screen and tmux. So when you want background execution for your uh, code, which you ideally need for all the other, like every homeworks, you can't just be carrying your laptop with, with it being open. So you can use Tmux or Screen. Screen is kind of the most prefer, preferred way. It's pretty straightforward and easy. Uh, screen is, you, you just create a screen and start running your code in a screen. And you can just close your laptop terminal, everything and go, it'll be running in the background. So that's what uh, screen does. With this command screen hyphen s, you can actually uh, create a screen. So I have now created a screen. So to, uh, then you can actually try running your code in this screen. Uh, just a minute. Okay, I think I've, I've started a lot of screens, so it wasn't there. Okay, actually it's inside the screen. Yeah. So after doing that, uh, you can actually try to run your code, get everything uh, set up and yeah, uh, to make sure that you have a background execution, you need to open screen. And uh, after you close the terminal to access the same screen where you are, you are running your uh, code, you need to have the uh, info about your login node. So you can't, if you just log, log in randomly, it will log into a random login node. So for that reason, you need to save your login node and use this command to log into the uh, login node to access the same screen. So after that, yeah, the next one is your screen. After going into the screen, you can actually see uh, which directory you're actually working on. So yeah, so as you can see, this is something called jet home and my username. So home is the directory where uh, Everyone, every student will actually be having like common resources. Don't dump any uh, like data or any big uh, files in, in home because uh, there is a cap on the storage for home directory. So whenever you log in, just make sure that you go to the project directory. So with CD uh, dollar project, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, So with this, you can actually go to the project node as shown here. It's like ocean projects and you have a project ID here and your username. So you can actually, uh, you have to shift it to the project node uh, before doing this. And until now we are still in the login node. So you shouldn't run any, any compute in the login node. So you can see it here that it's still in the login node. Is, is project automatically generated? Yeah, it's already there. So after you, you have two directories, the home one for the common space and every user actually has a project directory. So it's, it's one per user, it's not one per SSH connection? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, the common one is the home directory. Yeah. Yeah, so project you have for your own. But you know, so it's, just, it's just one per person. Yeah. Like there is a project for yeah. your user. Yeah. yeah, so you have more storage in the project directory. So that's the reason uh, why you need to use a project directory. And after this, 
you are in your login node, you are in your project directory. Now you want a GPU to run your experiments on. So you have three commands to actually uh, uh, get GPU as per your uh, needs. So we'll actually be testing out with Interact now. So it just uh, gets you a single GPU. And what you can do is you can just run this command, which is given here. It will give you a single GPU for uh, eight hours. So I'm just taking this command, putting it here. Now it's actually trying to give uh, a GPU for me. So it takes a, like a few seconds. And then you will actually get a V100 GPU, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, you will. So V100 is pretty expensive in uh, cloud and AWS, I guess. Just you have a bunch of credits which for which you can actually use V100 for a little less expensive than the others, I guess. So yeah, nodes V002 are ready for the job. Now, if you can see, the login actually has disappeared from here. From this, it has actually disappeared, which means that uh, we are not currently at the login node now. We are actually in the compute node or the GPU node. Here is when you can actually uh, run your codes and everything. Uh, so to check what GPU you have, you can actually do NV, NVIDIA SMI. So you have uh, a Tesla V100 GPU, and this percentage gives you a GPU usage. Uh, so an efficient, uh, efficient implementation of your code is that this percentage usage, usage should be 100. So until you get that, just try increasing the batch sizes. Uh, we want the most efficient use of the GPUs, and making this 100 is the best. So uh, that's kind of a good thing to do. And yeah, here are the commands for like S batch and uh, S1. So it depends on what uh, GPU and uh, how much time or what pro for what process you need them for. For now, I just took interact because it's just a short time process. Just one GPU is enough. And yeah, NVIDIA SMI helps you to see about the GPU usage. And HTOP tells you about the process, CPU usage, and RAM. So if we just press HTOP. Yeah, so it shows you how much RAM and everything. Memory is there, RAM is used in this. And uh, if, a, if your program crashes, then it's possibly that the RAM has been uh, used completely and uh, that will happen here. So it will also show you the process which are actually running. So mine's, yeah, mine was kind of there in between. So yeah, so this helps you to monitor those things. So, <coughs> If your job crashes, you can actually request for more RAM as well. So that's something which you can do. And after quit, we'll quit like pressing that uh, part of the screen. And yeah, this is the same thing which I actually uh, like explained now. So now, yeah, going on to how you can actually upload your files. So you, you have gone to your login nodes. Now you need to upload your uh, code files, data files, or, and so on into your directory. So to do that, you can actually use the SCP command. So you must be using SCP for AWS as well. So, so what you basically need to do is, so just let me take, So I'll try to upload my uh, uh, AWS key, which is actually in my uh, desktop. You just need to press, uh, type in the command SCP from the directory, which has the file which you need to be uploaded. With your username. This is Bridges, sorry about that. So the, pay, the same thing which you use for uh, SSH. And after the colon, you actually have to give your project directory or else it won't be uploaded properly. So from this, we can actually see where we are. So this is the project directory. I'm gonna, let me just put LS and see. Okay, we don't have the file yet. So if I just take this project directory and give it here, it'll ask me for the password again.
Okay, I made a mistake in the username again. So it's like I started this PSC for an assignment like two days ago, and it has been a hard time. I think again I need attention for remember long remembering long sequences. So that's a bad joke. Mm, that's ASRI and IV six. So hopefully it will work now. Yeah, now it's been uploaded to the uh, base to the this directory. So giving ls will give me the file. Yeah, the files over here. So you have to upload your Python files, or you can even do git clone and uh, download repositories for your midterm assignments, midterm project reports. So when you are re-implementing the uh, baselines. So yeah, make sure that you uh, specify the project directory. If you don't specify any directory, then there's a chance that it gets uploaded to the home directory, not the project directory, which I was mentioning earlier. So after doing this, you just need to start with an environment and run your code. Conda is not there by default, so you will have to install Conda if you need an environment. Uh, it's, e it's easier to like in install uh, a, a Python virtual environment so some resources about just a minute. Yeah, this link actually shows you how to install a uh, normal uh, Python environment with VNV. Uh, I actually installed the test environment here. And uh, to do that, and after in my, uh, like uh, installing it, you just need to do source test bin TV. Now it's inside the test environment. So this, this link basically has all the commands for you to install, uh, create an environment, and this just activate an environment. So this is pretty straightforward. You just need these two uh, commands. Is, uh, the, is, hmm? the, is the environment in the project folder? Yeah, it's in the project uh, folder. Persistent? What? Oh? Is it persistent? Uh, like, yeah, yeah it, it is persistent, yeah, yeah. Why, why bother with the virtual environment then? Yeah, you can do it. It's your wish. This is kind of easier. The virtual environment just, you know, if you have multiple things to do, just compartmentalize. Gotcha. Them, right? So if you're just working on one homework, it doesn't really matter, but if you're switching yeah. back and forth. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. This is good practice. Yeah. So it's basically you in you can make a directory for homework one, create a virtual environment, install all the dependencies for it. So you can work on it. For in, inside another directory, you can create another virtual environment, then activate it. So it's pretty easy if you're yeah, as you told, compartmentalizing it. So after doing that, you just need to do pip3 install. The default is Python 3, so you can't just do Python and run every script. You have to do Python 3 and run it. <coughs> so that's what you need to do. And you have uh, bash scripts. You can run, uh, if, you can, if you actually observe a lot of Git uh, repositories, they'll actually have a run sh uh, uh, file which helps you to run your code, like testing or training. So you can actually run it with the bash commands. Or you can just say Python uh, train. Here you'll have to put it as Python 3 train. So I have a PSC testing file which I uploaded here. So it's basically, uh, where was it? It's basically a normal network like uh, ResNet 152, which I imported from Torch Vision and uh, just a normal uh, random data set class. Uh, you just need to, after installing all the libraries, which I just a minute. So I had to install a, a bunch of libraries by my own here, like Torch, a Torch Vision, and TQDM, so that I can run my code. You can do it with a requirements txt file as well. After this, you just need to put Python 3 and run your code, that's it. So if you do that, you'll actually, uh, your code will be running now. The import statements are uh, working now. So it will print some messages and uh, you should be good to go. So it will create a model, it will start, it's just a validation code which I took. So yeah, device code or data set created. So that's what, there's something. Can we con connect this to Colab? Um, I'm not sure if you can connect this to Colab. There is a way to actually access uh, Jupyter Notebooks, but uh, it's a painful task to actually access Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, if you can actually put everything inside uh, 
pi files that will be great that will be the easiest one for you to do so yeah as you can see this is the uh, model which i printed out so this is currently inside the screen so now uh, if i just close the screen the model will be running again and i'll have to use the login uh, the same login node to access the screen and get the model's performance so this is basically it uh, how you can actually access psc compute resources just need to like a uh, summarization of it is that log in with the login node and after logging in you will have to change it change to your project directory screen is optional but it is recommended because uh, or else you can't just close your terminal so open a screen uh, move to the project directory not the home directory project directory after that uh, request a gpu node any gpu node uh, as per your specification like how much time away you want after that uh, what you need to do you have to upload your files uh, after uploading your files create a virtual environment and after doing that just run your code train your model and that's it so that's it for psc and it's a good resource which you can actually use uh, for a lot of things so yeah any questions regarding psc or uh, attention or anything else how about we can't work on it after writing the entire code and after making sure that yeah you can actually use vim to uh, yeah i forgot to mention that so you can use vim to edit the uh, uh, edit the files which you have uploaded uh, but vim might be a little painful uh, you can also use vs code to access locally so if you are familiar with how you can access aws with vs code you can do the same here also uh you can try that so that works so any other questions i have a question about uh um, yeah i'm oh, sorry i have a question about you were saying that we should um big 100% yeah um where do you see that again what like where do you see that oh, okay so uh, the question for the people on zoom was i mentioned that we have to use 100% of the gpu so where do you actually see that when you're trading now you now there's actually a screen going on right so i don't remember the login node you can close the screen so after closing the screen you have to log into the same login node which you remember like with this command so yeah with this command you have to log into the same login node mm. Yeah, same login node, and after doing that, if you do NVIDIA SMI, you can actually see which process is taking with GPU, like how much GPU is actually being utilized. Yeah, so yeah, uh, going to the same login node, yeah, you, you can actually do that. Okay. Uh, if I am logging to another login node, I won't be able to see. No, you won't be able to see. So, so that's why you have to. Login node is um, like assigned particular computer. Yeah, so if you actually log into a login node and then start a compute node, those that compute node is just for that login node. So That's now, right. if you log into a just do login, mm -hmm. uh, it will go to a different log, login node. Okay, yeah, you have to remember it. What about you, Eric? Um, uh, yeah, before you, that, just yeah. so the question uh, for the people on Zoom is that uh, the compute node is just specific for uh, one login node, or is it common? So yeah, that's the and I gave the answer for it. So uh, uh, if you interact with the GPU mm. for eight hours, right, mm. and then you run a test and your test ends in four hours, mm. does your usage end, or did you use up eight hours of credits? Uh, your GPU utilization will be easy. Yeah. For the people on Zoom, uh, if you actually uh, request a GPU for eight hours, and if the test uh, complete, gets completed in like four hours, what's the utilization of it? The, for the next four hours is basically your gpu utilization will be zero so you're not technically running a gpu so it will be a little bit uh, but not that much as much as you're actually running the gpu is there a way to request a gpu hmm. thing that ends when your code ends oh i'm not very sure about that but i can actually ask ask the person who actually helped me pass this and let you know he is kind of a pro in this Okay. Uncredited student of Professor Bhikshar. 
Cool. Because um, okay. I, I was kind of imagining, like, let's say I wanted to run eight tests, right? I wanted no. to do two values and four values or something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know if I should run them in a line, mm -hmm. you know, so they run one after the other. That might take more than eight hours. Yeah. Or if I should start up, like, eight different requests that die when they end. I don't know which one's better. Cool. Uh, you can actually run everything separately also with different login nodes and uh, different screens. With the same login node also, I think you can create multiple screens and do it. So you can actually do that as well. I would, I would, yeah, I would imagine you would log into one, create a screen session, yeah. request an interaction, make a new screen, request an interaction. Yeah. Is that, is that better than running them all in one? I don't have a straight answer. I can actually refer to the guy and uh, let okay. me yeah. yeah, I'm kind of new to it. Sure. I'd be, guy... I'd be curious if there's a way to like run something mm -hmm. such that it just dies when it ends. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't like, because it might take two hours, you know, you don't yeah. want to keep claiming it. Yeah. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. Oh. The guy basically forced me to learn this like two days ago <laughs> and had to, because he knows the importance of this resource, I guess. Okay. Is there any question here? There's a question on Zoom. What's the difference between S1 and S2? Just a minute. They're talking about S patch and. Yeah. Okay, this is a typo. Uh, I, yeah, I think this is a typo here. So S patch is, uh, should be used for a different case, I believe. So. I would say uh, Google, it. I'm pretty aware of Interact, and yeah, there should be a difference between that. This is a typo, I guess, yeah. I've been, uh, for our situation, uh, Interact should be enough if you actually request it for more than eight hours. Sorry, sorry you can request it for more than eight hours. Uh, either one should be good. Uh, S1 or S patch should be good enough for our homeworks. So wait just a minute. Yeah, okay. I think you get a shared GPU with S patch, but I'm not very sure about it. But yeah, I can get back to you on that. Anything else? Any other question? It looks like S1 might be this shared. It says yeah, S1, sorry, S1. S1 doesn't We'll make sure to give a documented <laughs> thing. I'll discuss with the other guy. Uh, give a documented uh, resource about it. And yeah, we'll make sure that that happens by Monday or something before you get the usernames. So if there aren't any other questions, I think we can stop recording and yeah, we can end it. Can we like sign up for it? Yes, sign, sign up for it right now.